Good morning. We'd like to take this opportunity to welcome everyone here to wish with us at Watkins this morning, whether if you're in person or online, we're happy that you're with us. Let us remember today is the day that the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. Would everyone please stand for the call to worship? God's love is extravagant. God's love is healing. God's love is generous. Thanks be to God for such extravagant, healing, generous love. Amen. Amen. We will now have our opening hymn, Abide With Me, hymn number 700. Remain standing for the affirmation of faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sit at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. Bring this 
to come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Let us continue worshiping with the Passover feast. rest in God. My hope comes from him. Truly, he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. Surely the lowborn are but a breath, the highborn are but a lie. If weighed on a balance, they are nothing. Together, they are only a breath. Do not trust in extortion or put vain hope in stolen goods. Though your riches increase, do not set your heart on them. One thing God has spoken, two things I have heard. Power belongs to you, God, and with you, Lord, is unfailing love. And you reward everyone according to what they have done. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning. And welcome to Watkins, whether you're first time here or hundredth time here. And we want to welcome all those who are joining us online this morning as well. And hope that you are warm and toasty like we are here in the sanctuary. Um, I do think that we get extra jewels in our crown for being here on such a cold Sunday. Would you agree? I think so too. But we are also glad you're here <laughs> online. Um, just a, a couple of announcements before the prayers of the people today. Um, I just want to first thank all of you that helped out with the memorial service yesterday, the one in December. I mean, this is when the church really steps up to love and to care for our church family. So thank you, thank you, thank you for all the many ways that people helped serve food, clean the building. I mean, there's a lot that goes on when we host these beautiful celebration of life services and I just want to make sure that you are thanked. So thank you for all of that. 
And as you may have read in your emails as well, Mr. Gene Sewell um, has passed away at the end of last week. Mr. Gene was a, a charter member here at Watkins and, and a beloved soul here in this space, and, and he has uh, gone on um, with the Lord. And so we will let you know when that service is coming up, and so be looking out for that. I would, I would think you would receive an email about that any day now for his service. That's Mr. Gene Sewell. Um, a beloved charter member here at Watkins. And so I know we'll be back sharing hospitality with folks, visiting from near and far in ways that we celebrate uh, a beloved foundational member here at Watkins. And so I just want to put that in your ear today. I do encourage you today to take a deep breath in with me and a deep breath out as we go to God in prayer. Will you pray with me? God of peace and lover of justice, we come before you with hearts filled with gratitude and thanksgiving for the countless women and men, past and present, who have worked tirelessly advocating for equality and promoting peace. May we be inspired by their bravery and wisdom. May we get to know one another, fostering trust and honoring our unique God-infused gifts to collaborate in order to continue to do the good hard work that is before us. We ask that you would nurture our relationships, prompting us to be curious about our differences and to delight in the ways we challenge one another. We pray for your guidance when the obstacles seem insurmountable and when our vision gets blurry. We pray for your tenderness when violence erupts and we fall into despair. Hear our heartfelt plea to show us the way to make a difference in a world that is seemingly constantly on fire. Prompt us to slow down and to focus on the depth of your love, our most gracious God. May we experience you in all of your fullness, allowing us to soften our hearts while we name injustice and speak truth to power. For God, during this time of great strife and chaos in our world, may we pay attention to the extraordinary things that are happening and the lovely people that are doing God's work. For in each place of mourning and of grief, for each place of violence and despair, God, we look for your helpers. We look for those who bring comfort and care, whether near or far, and help us, God to see that good being put back out into the world. For you, God, are the God of all beautiful things, and we ask that you bless the work that is happening all around within us and all around the world, sending messages of hope, mercy, and love. And may we seek those things as well. May we be this. We ask all of this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, who taught his disciples a long time ago to pray, but also teaches us to pray, saying in one voice, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We now come to the time of our service where we worship God with the giving of our tithes and our offerings. There are many ways that we're able to respond to God's goodness from the QR codes and the Venmo. And uh, if you're in person, there is, of course, a plate that will come around. But we respond because God is doing a new thing. We respond because we know that God has provided all that we need. And we continue to bless the world around us by that same gracious response. May the ways that we respond to God be the ways that we view God. Amen.
God, we give you thanks for the many blessings in this life, for those that go seen and those that go unseen. Give you thanks that there is no place you are not and no face and no situation that you are not. And so, God, as we respond to the goodness of our own hearts, may you come to bless those that give and those that receive, that may go to further our mission and ministries at Watkins to make this a place to belong, to be people of peace, to put good back out into the world. And for that opportunity, God, we give you thanks. We ask all of this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ and all God's beloved children said, amen. I do ask that you are seated as we sing this morning's hymn of preparation, which is come and fill our hearts, which is in the faith we sing or found on the screens in front of you. I encourage you to sing that together. It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? It's a neighborly day in this beauty wood, a neighborly day for a beauty. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? I've always wanted to have a neighbor just like you I've always wanted to live in a neighborhood with you So let's make the most of this beautiful day Since we're together we might as well say Would you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? Won't you please? Won't you please? Please won't you be my neighbor? So I will say, not that it's a competition at all, but the 11 o'clock has really started to sing along with that song, and 9 o'clock, you got to catch up a little bit, I think, right? right? But today we're continuing our message series called Won't You Be My Neighbor, where we're taking a look at some stories and scripture about what it means to be a neighbor. We've learned who is my neighbor last week, and then we also learned uh, from, from Fred Rogers' life as well. So it's a combination of a book uh, of scripture, it's a combination of the art of neighboring, which is what my Wednesday night class will be, uh, hopefully, right, it was supposed to start last week, but, you know, things happen, hopefully this week, 
we'll, we'll try it again. So the art of neighboring, and then also um, some things that we can learn from the life of Fred Rogers, of course, that made that, that fantastic show, uh, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. And so today we'll pivot a little bit in talking about uh, the neighbors we may or may not know. How many of you filled out your eight blocks last week? Remember your neighborhood map? All right. If you do not have one or maybe you misplaced it, there are plenty of copies out there in the lobby. I do encourage you to fill those out and to make sure that you can get each one the A, the B, and the C from their names to kind of surface level information about them to the deeper level information of ways that we're able to love our neighbors. We start with knowing their names, right? And so I do encourage you and challenge you to do that with me. So before we open up God's word for us, let us go to God in prayer. Will you pray with me? Oh God, we are grateful. We're grateful that you're here in this space. And, and for that, God, we're just grateful for a warm space that we're able to come to. And so God, may in that same word, the Holy Spirit enliven us and speak over this word today. That we may hear something new, that we may hear something fresh, that we know comes from only you, oh God. That we may not only come to intellectually understand who you are, as important as that may be, but that we may come to experience you from the inside out. We ask all of this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ and all God's beloved children said, amen. I do ask that you'll stand as you're able for the reading of this morning's gospel lesson. We'll be reading from the gospel of Luke, the seventh chapter, verses 37 through 50. Meanwhile, a woman from the city, a sinner discovered that Jesus was dining in the Pharisee's house. She brought perfumed oil in a vase made of alabaster. Standing behind him at his feet and crying, she began to wet his feet with her tears. She wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured the oil on them. When the Pharisee who had invited Jesus saw what was happening, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. He would know that she is a sinner." Jesus replied, Simon, I have something to say to you. <laughs> Teacher, speak, he said. A certain lender had two debtors. One owed enough money to pay 500 people for a day's work. The other owed enough money for 50. And when they couldn't pay, the lender forgave the debts of both of them. Which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the largest debt canceled. Jesus said, you have judged correctly. Jesus turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? When I entered your home, you didn't give me water for my feet, but she wet my feet with tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but she hasn't stopped kissing my feet since I came in. You didn't anoint my head with oil, but she has poured perfumed oil on my feet. This is why I tell you that her many sins have been forgiven. So she has shown great love. The one who's forgiven little loves little then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other table guests began to say among themselves, who is this person that even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I believe our neighborhoods are, in, are, are, are filled with what I would call invisible neighbors. Invisible neighbors. People we see but we know nothing about. We may see them go in and out of their houses throughout the day. We may see their cars drive straight into the garage, put the garage door down and walk into their house without a peep. And if we don't see them, I think we see remnants of them. Whether it's toys or, or newspapers flying into your yard or leaves like we'll find in mine or, or trash cans that seem to get rolled out and rolled back in, but no human nearby to see. <laughs> but they're really quite invisible to us. We may know they exist, but we know nothing about them. And when someone is invisible to us, some things go through our mind, whether intentionally or unintentionally, about who they are. <laughs> have you felt this before? Sure we have. We assume things about the neighbor we know nothing about. We start to come to make up our own stories about who they are, where they come from, or what they like to do, although we have never spoken a word to them. 
We make assumptions and stories in our minds that may or may not be true. Their grasp is high, so they must be lazy. But in reality, they're the main caregiver for an aging parent. I've had that happen to me before. We fear them even. And fear, I think, is one of the strongest motivations in our society. We fear people we do not know, and we are fearful of what they may think about us. And when people are invisible... Well, we assume things about them and or we may fear them. (laughs) Then these, I would argue, create a great mental divide between us and our neighbors. One of my favorite parts of the gospel story this morning is Jesus' question, right? He asked this question because he could see what was going through his disciples' minds. Jesus looks at Simon and asks him this great question. Do you remember this question? Do you see this woman? (laughs) Do you see this woman? It's a a profound question, I believe. I think it's one of the biggest, largest, most impactful questions in all of Scripture. Do you see this woman? Yes, much like our invisible neighbors, Jesus asked us that same sort of question. Do you see this person? He is not questioning whether Simon can see her physically with his eyes. He's not saying, do you need glasses? You know, that's not the question he is asking. But she has become an invisible woman to him and the rest of the crew. It's an interesting question, isn't it? Found in a very interesting story. There's this dinner party, and people have been invited, and Jesus is reclining at the table, and suddenly an uninvited guest comes by. She's a woman with a reputation, and it's not quite the most positive reputation with others in the room. And she follows this common practice that a lower servant class would do when they walk into place. And not only does she wash the feet of Jesus, which are dusty from walking with sandals on dirt roads from place to place, it's kind of gross, but washing them with her perfume and then drying them with her hair. She's an invisible woman to the men in these rooms. And when she does this act, there is a resounding question that maybe you have asked before. Who does she think she is? (laughs) Have you asked that question before? Maybe it's not one that you said out loud. Maybe it's one that just went through your mind. Or maybe it's a side comment that you made to somebody else in the room. Who do they think they are? I wonder how this reverberates in the room and even ways that we don't have in Scripture. A woman who loves becomes the exemplar of what it means to be human. In a very male-dominated text from a very male-dominated society, it is the the sinner woman who shows Simon what it means to love. The passage here, the passage here highlights the twelve in conjunction with the woman. But how do the twelve view this woman? They give her a label. It's as if she walked in with a big old name tag on her that said one word, sinner. Sinner. They don't know her. They don't know her name. They don't know her hopes and dreams. They know nothing about her own family. They know nothing about what she is fearful of. They don't know that this is what she's striving to do, if she's been to school or not, or if she has children, or or if there's anything about her, her favorite food or color, anything about this woman. They know one thing, and that is just a label plopped on her sinner. And... If we're being honest about the twelve, that's all they care to know. (laughs) So Simon sees her, and he's loathing the idea that she is touching Jesus ever since she walked into the room. He sees her as an embarrassment amongst the prominence of the table. Simon isn't blind to the situation. He is loathing with anger. In her anger, all he sees is a sinner. 
can't get past her reputation, her notoriety in, 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 in the part of this city. He can't see her as a human being because she is different than him in the company that he has around him. My friends, I would say we do the same thing every day. <laughs> We do the same thing every day. We see someone uh, of a different age than ourselves, and we think they're too young or they're too old to know anything. We see someone of a different political party, and then they are too conservative or they are too liberal to have any common sense. We see someone as a, a different race, not to be trusted, so we cross to the other side of the road. We see someone as a different religion, as not enlightened and in need of saving. I wonder, how do we view people that are different from ourselves? Whether it's age or race or political party or religion, they become, I would say, invisible. And I would argue that it is very hard to be a neighbor to someone that you treat as invisible. In the book, The Simple Faith of Mr. Rogers, that I talked about last week, written by Amy Hollingsworth, she tells this great story about the way that Fred Rogers view other people. See, Fred Rogers, you may or may not know, attended Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, and he became a, a Presbyterian minister in 1963. Did you know that? I mean... Many of you maybe. He, he, didn't, he didn't serve in a pulpit or, or that kind of ordained ministry, but he served and ministered to all who watched his show. And one of his favorite professors in seminary was Dr. William Orr. And Fred would sign up for every class that Orr taught because he loved him and he loved the teaching so much. In one time, Fred re reflects upon this in the book with Amy. She, he gave these words to Fred, Dr. Orr did, these wise words about good and evil and the ways that we view other human beings. Orr told Fred these words. Orr said, evil would like nothing better than to have us feel awful about who we are. Evil would like nothing better than to have us feel awful about who we are. And that would be back in here in our minds, and that's the same view we would view our neighbor and see only what is awful in our neighbor. And in fact, we only look for what is awful in our neighbor. But on the other side of the spectrum, on what is good, and that is Jesus, or said these words, but Jesus would want us to feel as good as possible about God's creation within us. And in here, he's talking about our minds, we would look through those eyes and see what's wonderful about our neighbor. Isn't that good? This brings me some hope, my friends. But Jesus would want us to feel as good as possible about God's creation within us. And it's in that view, in that lens, that we are able to see what is wonderful about our neighbor. Do you see that good and bad thing going on here? What is bad, we can only see what is awful within our neighbor and what is awful within ourselves. But Jesus and Fred Rogers, through Dr. Orr, would say, we don't look for what is awful within them. We look for what is what? Wonderful. Wonderful. I love that. There's so much tremendous truth in it. That, and it's true for me, and I'll just be confessional here as your pastor. It's a safe place. When I am feeling awful about myself, it, it's through that lens that I see other people. When I am feeling awful about myself, it is through that lens that I see other people. And I can finally make up awfulness about my neighbor, right? When I am not in a healthy state, I have not prayed enough. I have not done my meditation. I have not eaten the right kinds of food. I am over-caffeinated, whatever it may be, right? I can see what is awful in somebody else because I am not in a healthy place. But when I am in a healthy place, after I spend time in prayer and meditation, and I am confident and secure that God has created me good, then I can see what is wonderful in my neighbor. But neighbors that may not look like us, 
Go with neighbors that may not act like us or, or believe like us. We can fall into thinking evil things about them. And we can fall into a trap into making them invisible or worse, demeaning them as less than human. I have another story for you. Segregation, of course, was no longer the law by the end of the 1960s. But black citizens were still not embraced as equal participants in public life. They were viewed and treated as being less than human beings by other people, something that I would say still happens today, and we have made great strides, but we cannot look away from it. But one of the ways in the 1960s that this was reflected was at community pools across the country, with white people preventing black people from sharing the water with them. And it was in this atmosphere that Fred Rogers performed a very simple yet meaningful act in one of the episodes in 1969. Do you remember this episode? Rogers invited Officer Clemens, who was a black police officer onto the show, to join him and to dip his feet in a small plastic wading pool. And when Officer Clemens dipped, sat down and placed his feet in the water right next to Mr. Rogers' feet, the two men broke a well-known color barrier. I'm going to show you a, a clip from that show, but I encourage you um, to watch it later. So we'll show this with also volume on. Oh, there's Officer Clemens. Hi, Officer Clemens. Come oh, in. Rogers, how are you? Fine. Won't you sit down? Oh, sure. Just for a moment. It's so warm. I was just... Uh, Putting some water on my feet. Oh, it sure is. Would you like to join me? It looks awfully enjoyable, but I don't have a towel or anything. Oh, you share mine. Okay, sure. Oh, Come along. Man. I'll put some more water in here. Oh. This is going to turn into a beautiful day. You like bare feet? Well, yeah. As I grew older, I liked it more and more. Uh huh. Good for you. You're pulling up your pants. I forgot to do that at first. Oh, I don't want them to get wet. Right. Oh, that feels great. Right here. <laughs> you know, when you're a policeman, you do an awful lot of walking. And sometimes your feet get tired. Right. That feels better already. Good. Just massage them a little bit. Cool water on a hot day. Hmm. Well, thank you for your refreshments. Oh, I'm glad you like it. <laughs> when this episode aired, it has only it had only been one year since Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. One year. Racial tensions were rising across our country, and Fred Rogers, I wonder if you could look in his eyes, knew exactly what he was doing. This episode couldn't erase a long history of discrimination and racism, but it was a step along the way. In 2018, Clemens, Francois Clemens, Clemens was his real name, said, said these words, and, and I want you to hear them today. He said this in 2018, the officer who played on that show, I carried the hope inside of me that one day the world would change. And I do feel that the world has still not totally changed, but it's changing. We're getting there. See, Fred Rogers used his TV show, used his platform to share the message of love, of kindness, of acceptance, of justice. He gave people names to their faces. Fred Rogers had, I would argue, the eyes to see the world in which Jesus desires us to see. And Fred Rogers had the eyes to see people as Jesus does. I wonder, as people tuned into that television show, how many worlds were rocked? <laughs> and how many conversations happened in rooms in which those conversations wouldn't have happened? My friends, I wonder, I wonder, does our discipleship lead us on that same path? 
Has Jesus' serious command, really a command, not just a, a nice suggestion to love our neighbors as we love ourselves, but a command proposed us and pushed us into a future to, to, that may even towards those in proximity that may look or think differently than us. Have we stood up or put our feet in the plastic wading pool of life with those who are marginalized and oppressed? Or have we been just really nice Christians who walk the same path at times, but not much has changed? You see, I wonder. I wonder if Jesus asked us that same question that he asked Simon 2,000 years ago. Rob, do you see that woman? Rob, do you see that human being? Would I be able to say yes? Would you be able to say yes? I wonder. Not, what is God calling you to do next? Where is God calling you to go next? And how might that affect the beautiful world we live in? To not assume the awful, but to see the wonderful. Will you pray with me about that? Oh God, we are grateful. We are grateful that you have put beauty within each one of us. We are, are, are grateful that you have put that, 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 that good stuff within each and every person. That you have created us in the image of God and you have created us wonderful. Yes, we may get it wrong sometimes. Yes, we may trip and we may fall. But God, that hand still continues to pick us up. Help us, O oh God, to have eyes to see. And not just an ocular function of life, but a ways that we are able to see our neighbor as created in that divine image. Ways that we're able to not just view people as invisible or less than or whatever we may put up around us. That we may see people as good and beautiful and even wonderful. And that we may be able to impact this world, not just with our kindness as much as the world needs it, but a sense of justice and of acceptance and of, of unity. Continue to ask us hard questions, God, that we may be able to wrestle with our answers and continue in this beautiful life together. We ask all of this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ and all God's beloved children said, amen. I ask now that you'll stand as you are able as we sing this morning's hymn of response, blessed be the tie that binds. Let us sing with joy.
Amen. A few announcements before we continue on today. Uh, we will begin, hopefully, walk-ins on Wednesdays, this Wednesday. So my morning Bible study will be back, studying the book of Nehemiah. And then we will also be having musical rehearsals and a dinner, a chili hot dog supper there in the Fellowship Hall. And so cross your fingers, say your prayers, right, that we're able to be here with that. My class will now go from a four-week intensive to a three-week intensive. And so if three is better than four for you, I do encourage you to come and to join me on Wednesday nights. Um, also, we'll be having our Ash Wednesday service. It is incredible that Lent is almost here already. Um, on February 14th, we'll have one service here at 6.30 in the sanctuary. We'll have that traditional um, putting on the ashes on our foreheads. And also, there we go, is our, uh, what I'll be doing on Wednesday nights during Lent is, is called Have a Beautiful, Terrible Lent. And so this is a book, uh, based off of a book by Dr. Kate Bowler, who is my friend at Duke Divinity School. Got to put, I didn't mention Duke at all in my sermon, so there you go. Oh, wow. uh, I know, incredible. Uh, called Have a Beautiful, Terrible Day, which is a uh, series of 100 blessings. Um, and so this comes with a daily devotional that you can download for free. They have daily emails to prompt you for that. And then we'll have weekly discussions on that. On Wednesday nights. And so it's called Have a Beautiful, Terrible Lent because life is both beautiful and terrible. And Lent helps us to put that in perspective. Even if you don't join us on Wednesday nights, uh, you'll have this information or email um, this week, hopefully, that'll have some signups of you can dive into Kate Bowler's material. There's a book that is just coming out next week that will go with it. Um, and I think you'll really enjoy it. Now receive this benediction this morning. Now go in the name and the power of Jesus Christ with people that have eyes to see and minds and hearts to experience all that is wonderful and lovely in our neighbor. They were able to go out and not see invisible folks wandering to and fro, but we may see beloved children of God in need of a friend, in need of relationship and connection. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace and peace, my friends.